realize this. Or maybe you have realized this, but there's a battle going on. Oh, not in Iran and Iraq and not in some faraway land. As a matter of fact, it's not very far at all. It's in your own home. It's in your own soul. There is within you a battle raging. Not just your flesh against your spirit and your spirit against your flesh because we're told that the spirit warreth against the flesh and the flesh against the spirit. And as you grow as a Christian, you learn to be able to discern between the two that you know you have certain evil desires, you know, that you sometimes you want to beat up on somebody or sometimes you, you know, you just wish they'd die or, you know, you think these unbelievable thoughts that you can't believe that come out of your own brain because you thought you were such a good person and then given the right circumstances you come off as really evil and corrupted which is what you are <laughs> you are an evil person believe it or not you were born in sin conceived in sin and you will die in sin that is your flesh now your spirit when you became born again you received something from heaven that came down to earth you received a part, as it were, of God himself, his spirit, to come inside you. Kind of like a deposit, so to speak. Kind of like a, a ernst of a promise to come, that you would one day become a spiritual being. But in the meantime, you were given a portion of his spirit inside that would begin to grow because you would be born again, not of the flesh, but of the spirit that you were born once of the flesh, but you were born spiritually dead. So suddenly now you have this holy seed, as it were, this spiritual seed, this newness that's come into your life that has become who you are, really. Because who you are physically, nah, that's the old you. We call that the old man. That's what you used to be. What you are meant to be is this little tiny spirit that grew up inside and is becoming more and more obvious by fruits of the spirit, peace, love, joy, meekness, temperance, kindness, gentleness, patience, long-suffering, grace, mercy, and all those things. But you see, because you have that inside, you have this spirit that's kind of like, you know, either growing or not growing. And then you have this uh, flesh, which is kind of like uh, not wanting the spirit to grow because it wants to be in charge. So you kind of have this split personality. We call it spiritual schizophrenia. You don't know what you are, so you're still trying to figure it out. Like, am I a fleshy Christian or am I a spiritual Christian? Am I a, what am I? But there's another part of you that's even more confusing. You have a soul. Now your soul is turned to and fro, up and down, turned all around, because your soul is where your emotions influence your spirit and your flesh. Your emotions can cause your spirit to be weighed down. Your emotions can cause your flesh to dominate the spirit. In other words, you could be depressed and you could weigh down your spirit, you know, and your spirit's going, oh God, you know, I'm full of love and joy and why am I so depressed? You know, and your flesh is going, yeah, man, I love being depressed because you know what? Misery loves company and it just makes my, my body feel so much better because, you know, it's down, but at least it's alive. So your soul's going, but I don't like this feeling. <laughs> it doesn't make me feel good. So you see, there's a tripartite. There's three parts of you, body, soul, and spirit, that is always kind of like in this battle because outside of you, everything is trying to get a hold of your soul and your body and your spirit and your mind and your heart and your soul and your strength and wants to take it away from the Lord. In other words, you live in a hostile environment. You live in a place that is not a Christian nation. No, it's not. I'm sorry. You know, there's no such thing as a Christian nation. You live in a world that is not a Christian world. I'm sorry. No, it's not. It's Satan's world. He owns it until God comes back. It's his. And you live in a place that has principalities. Principalities means that there's this huge covering over us that is dominating the area with which we live in. That's a principality. That is a, 
like the principality of a city. You know, it, it has this huge area of influence. And so there's this evil, wicked principality that dominates portions of the world. And then there's also powers that are in the world that are corrupted things from what used to be good have now become evil. And so these powers are out there to influence you in certain ways. So these powers underneath this covering of the principality or principalities is influencing you to go like into, say, politics or sports or some other thing. Because it's a power to do something. It gives you a prideful feeling. It makes you feel strong because it builds up your flesh and your ego and your strength. It's a power. Remember that. A power to do something. Then there's spiritual wickedness in high places where actually you have angelic beings who are literally coming down from heaven to earth and kind of manipulating things in your circumstances to try to cause you to stumble or fall or to be tripped up in some way so that you won't pay attention to what Jesus has to say and you won't do what God wants you to do. So there are principalities, powers, and spiritual wickedness in high places that you war against, that you fight against, that is at enmity with you. Because once you became born again, you were no longer part of this world. Now, you could occupy this world and pretend like you're going to renovate it for God. Although, whatever you're renovating is going to be annihilated in the tribulation period. Because if you read about that, once, uh, you know, kind of like if we talked about the polar shift, well, all the continents change. They kind of get mashed back together. That's going to wipe out any plans you have. Then we're going to have kind of like, you know, almost all vegetation gets wiped out by fires and smoke and flood and plague and all these other things. So that kind of wipes out any ideas you have. Then we also have kind of like, um, well, it says that the mountains would be removed. Uh, take a look at Everest. If you move Everest and wipe it out to a plain, flat playing field, God's going to level everything and the only thing that's going to be lifted up anywhere in the world it's Jerusalem. Okay, you know, it's just going to be kind of a gentle rise. So in order to do that, you kind of got to flatten everything. Which, judging by everything that man has made, I don't think that's such a bad idea if you're going to start over again anyways. So really, this isn't your home, and your future in the millennium isn't going to be some mini city you set up. <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> Technology doesn't go with you into the kingdom. I'm sorry. It just doesn't work that way. God's in control. So we see that there's going to be a great difference in Western, mechanized, modernized civilization. And we may be returning to a agrarian theocracy that deals with God on a personal, intimate level. Because when you're dealing with creation, you kind of got to depend on God a little more. You know, you kind of like realize, hey, you know what? When I look at the way things grow, I realize that's how I grow. So God brings us back to the reality of what we were meant to be when the end of this age is over, when the age of man, dominant, is brought back to God in control. So in that as we end the end of this age that we're living in, we find ourselves bombarded with information. Oh man, it's the end of the world, oh man, oh this, oh that, oh here, oh there. And we're being rushed and pushed and manipulated and challenged by principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places, as well as our own flesh which wars against us. So in all this battlefield and warfare, what are we going to do? Should we be like the army and go out and kill somebody? Uh, I don't think you know who the battle is. You see, the battle is for your soul. If Satan, the god of this world, can get you to become a violent person, then you will be like it was in the days of Noah, when the world was filled with violence and every imagination of man was towards violence. Everything that man thought about was violent in nature. So if you could be turned to become violent, then you will be just like that generation that was wiped out from the planet Earth 
that was completely annihilated in condemnation by God saying, I have had it. Flesh before me is all corrupted. They have corrupted their way. So we need to find out what is the way that we should be. Because you see, in that Genesis, it talks about man corrupted his way. Using the word the way, you should already know what's coming because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. That means we should be doing what Jesus says to do. What did he say to do to be the way? What was his way? See, followers of him were called followers of the way. And at one time, there was a popular movement that was called the way, but they were kind of a cult. It's too bad because that would have been a better kind of title than Christian. But anyways, such as it is, you know, if we become Christ-like, then we become Christian. So what would Christ-likeness be? Well, Jesus said, love your enemies, turn the other cheek, do all these things. And he wasn't using that as an example to be a compromise so that we could still kill. But rather, he said at the end of it, blessed are you if you do these things. Because in your house will stand, I'll protect you, I'll take care of you, I'll provide for you, I'll do all these things. I'll be God and you'll be my children. But if you don't do these things, then yeah, go ahead, go out, get a gun, go out, build a house, go do your thing, you know, and then guess what? When the storms of life come and I'm not protecting you, you're wiped out. Well, that don't seem fair. Well, who are you trying to personify? Are you trying to reveal Jesus and a real living God? Or are you trying to reveal, I trust in God, but I trust in my arms better? Uh, the Bible says that they that trust in Egypt would be cast down. They that trust in the sword would be thrown down. They that trust in their arms would be brought to despair. But they that trust in the Lord shall renew their strength. And they that wait upon the Lord would be caught up like eagles. They that trust in the Lord would, what, be not in their own understanding. In all their ways they acknowledge him, and he would direct it back. So he would spare them from any kind of, oh no, we're going to get wiped out. Because we don't live in this world. We're passing through it. And as passing through, we tell others how to get to it, to get through it, so they can go to him and be with him. You get it? We could wrap it if you want to, but I don't think so. So, in this world that you're fighting and being fought within, the battle is inside you, recognize that all these things are coming upon you and bombarding you to make you frustrated so that you don't stop, take a look around and say, you know, maybe I don't want to get involved in that. Maybe I don't want to be frustrated. Maybe I don't want to get pol political. Maybe I don't want to worry about those things because I can trust in the Lord. And if God can't turn the king's heart, whichever way he chooses, and he can't change his mind, then what kind of God do I have? I mean... Am I supposed to be politically active or am I supposed to be perfectly active? See, there's a difference. Politically active means you're doing it. Perfectly active means God's doing it. Which do you want to accomplish? God doing it or you doing it? That's your choice. Hoard nothing. Love me and do my will and no evil shall befall you. Take no thought for tomorrow. Rest in my presence brings peace. God will help you. Desire brings fulfillment. Peace, like a quiet flowing river, cleanses and sweeps all irritants away. You shall be taught. Continue in prayer times, even if they seem, for a moment, fruitless. The devil will try by any means to stop them. Heed them not. He will say evil spirits may enter in, or that you would be distracted. Heed it not. Rest your nerves. Tired nerves are a reflection on, not of, God's power. Hope all the time. Do not be afraid of poverty. Let money flow freely. I will let it flow in, but you must let it flow out. I never send money to stagnate, only to those who pass it on. Keep nothing for yourself. Hoard nothing. Only have what you need and use, and this is my law of discipleship. 
the reality of giving and getting was never meant so that you could set yourself up with fancy clothes, multiple cars, a nice little house, and all these things that could get wiped out in the next flood and next wipeout situation. But rather, you're supposed to be using them for the ministry, for your ministry, because you have a ministry. You were called, chosen, selected, and born for such a time as this, that living in this last generation, you would be a light unto the world. You would be the peace that passes all understanding when everyone else is going, oh no, it's here for the world. And you're going, well, not right now, not this year, but after this year, yeah, I would say, get ready, Jesus is coming. Be prepared. We've been planning this for a long time. We're not going to have an IRA and a retirement account. We're going to invest in the kingdom of God. And we're going to plan for those times that he comes so that we would be doing the master's will and not our own when he returns. So what are you doing? Are you still learning about God? Or have you begun to discover the battle inside you is waging way heavily and you're losing ground because you're not being found in literally the Sermon on the Mount and you're not found to be one of those who is really <laughs> less fried out and less angry and less mad that you're beginning to give mercy to people that don't deserve mercy that you're beginning to forgive people that don't deserve to be forgiven that you're beginning to love people that don't deserve to be loved that you're beginning to be like Jesus when you never thought you could be like Jesus you're beginning to be Christian 